Thank you all for being here. Thank you for joining us in the eye of a firestorm uh, between one fire that's hit us and anticipating a crazy wind event, what they're calling historic and dire coming up on Saturday. I want to thank, uh, first of all, the governor, Governor Newsom, Tom Porter, Cal Fire, Mark Gillarducci, all of our elected representatives. We've got McGuire here, our state senator, Jim Wood. We've got the mayor of Hillsburg, city manager, Celeste, our uh, public health official here in Sonoma County, our congressman, Jared Huffman, uh, our sheriff, Mark Essick, and many more, Susan Gorn. It's great to see you, my colleague here. Uh, this, is, this is the team that's deploying, and I want to first of all thank the state because they have sent the Armada. We have a fleet out there right now going after the fire the Kincaid fire in a way that it needs to be done in the next two to three days to prepare for another wind event, which is really making us bristle a little bit. And, uh, but at the same time, we've had the partnership and the resources deployed. And I've had a lot of people who have told me out of all the incidences they've seen, they have not seen this kind of force come in and this kind of coordination. So having gone through this two years ago and you coming out with us, uh, it's a crazy time to say, here we are again but we are more prepared than ever. Uh, you can tell by the sense on the ground and the individuals, there's not that same frenzy uh, that was there before, but at the same time, this is gonna test us. So uh, we're in a situation right now. Uh, thank you for being here and taking a lead on an issue that none of us decide to be leaders on, but we have to embrace and go with. So I'm gonna pass it on over to the governor and thank you all so much. Thank you, Supervisor. Thanks for all your leadership, and let me thank the elected officials assembled behind me, but more importantly, let me thank the men and women out on the front lines uh, that are keeping you safe and doing heroic work. Not only those uh, that wear the badge of your local jurisdiction and the state, Cal Fire, but folks uh, that are providing mutual aid from all throughout the state of California uh, and from outside of the state of California. I was just down in Southern California, a new fire sparking in San Diego. Uh, we are monitoring two fires in Los Angeles County uh, and two fires here uh, in Northern California, though the Muir fire seems to be substantially under control. The biggest concern, obviously, in the northern part of the state is Kincaid. Uh, and while we are enjoying a moment of respite uh, away from the wind events, uh, as the supervisor said, we're expecting those winds to whip back up uh, on Saturday evening. Uh, into Sunday, potentially uh, dissipating, we hope, uh, on Monday. And so the expectation of these now commonly referred to PSPS, uh, the de-energization, uh, is likely to occur uh, at scale again uh, into the weekend, uh, despite the fact that now we're down to about 6,700 customers uh, that are currently de-energized uh, in uh, the PG&E territories. Uh, so this is multifaceted. We are a nation state, so we are conducting ourselves all across this state by allocating appropriate resources. And as the supervisor said, we've never had more resources in this space uh, than we do today. Uh, we'll be bringing in uh, 747 into the area for exclusive use in the state of California. You'll see uh, that aircraft uh, in the very uh, near uh, future, meaning in the next uh, number of hours. We've got our DC-10s up there. We've got other suppression uh, equipment in the air. Those that often don't see uh, that suppression in the air should just know this. There's a reason. It's not because we're neglecting. It's because of conditions that are not appropriate for those aircraft. Uh, not only uh, the issues of suppression in the air related to wind conditions or literally clarity issues, inversion, and that layer where you need to get low, and if you can't actually get low, there's no point in bringing those aircrafts up, but that does not deny the work that's being done underneath the hand crews that are out there, the bulldozers that are out there, and the lines that are being drawn in and around the fire uh, to contain it. Uh, we have the best and the brightest in this business, and that's not a governor saying that. I'm not paid to say that, it's not because I think that, it's because I know that, because I've had the experience, you had the experience here in the North Bay, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, some of the finest folks that exist in the business doing heroic work, and they are preparing for Saturday night, they're preparing 
for Sunday, and they are working with meteorologists. They're working with data that's state of the art. They're working with new LADAR technology, new radar technology, new satellite technology, uh, and working with our federal partners, not just our local partners, uh, in concert to develop strategies and to map and anticipate the movement uh, not only the Kincaid fire, uh, but the other fires, the tick fire in particular in, in Los Angeles County, uh, that obviously are posing most of the anxiety and concern. I don't want to go back, but I do think it's important to remind folks uh, of some of the preparation. Uh, it's been interesting, the coverage that was given, though understandably it was given, to the new technologies we're rolling out on cameras. Uh, we have substantially increased our investment in last year's budget, uh, and we are expecting to significantly enhance that in future years for more uh, technology that allows that early detection uh, through these cameras. You saw the specific benefits of that camera and the Kincaid fire in terms of allowing us earlier response times uh, and the like. But we also were aided by pre-positioning. We put an historic amount of money this year to pre-position assets all around the state. We were the beneficiary of that pre-positioning here. Uh, and as a consequence, I think mitigated what may have been an even more extreme event. One again, we continue to manage as we speak. Uh, and that uh, is complementary uh, to those assets uh, that include new Black Hawk helicopters, $109 million in the budget for procurement of those helicopters, new C-130s, seven of them that we have procured that are now being rolled uh, into the fleet. It will take some time to implement uh, the inclusion of that entire feat, but those assets are now uh, underway. Those investments have been made. Historic vegetation management investments, proactive efforts to address the vulnerabilities of 200 communities in this state uh, through some forest management and vegetation management techniques that required me to declare an emergency before an emergency. And that work is being complemented by the National Guard that we took off a political operation on the border uh, to Mexico and brought a substantial number of the National Guard uh, to complement our hand crews uh, and our vegetative management work. And by the way, thank you to the National Guard for the extraordinary work they're doing. And they continue to provide resources that are pre-positioned as well and will aid and abet our efforts. I want to thank the Department of Justice uh, and their work to address issues that we consider at these moments, price gouging, people that take advantage of vulnerable communities, people that make runs on groceries and gas. We want to make sure that they're safe, people are being respectful, people aren't panicking, but also that people aren't taking advantage of this situation. We are working with California Chamber, and we are working with our business uh, agency, referred to as GoBiz, uh, to make sure that people are aware that people are still open for business in this community. Uh, that. Uh, we want to continue to see commerce. We want to consider continue to see tourism as is appropriate in certain areas, uh, and we are mapping that out and promoting uh, the same. We are working uh, double time to address the issue of health and safety. Uh, our Department of Health and Human Services uh, working with the counties, working with the cities to make sure the most vulnerable are uh, reached out to, wellness visits, efforts at the local level, working with the hospitals to make sure people are appropriately taken care of. This remains a vexing issue and a top priority for all of us. Accordingly, uh, we are working to provide resources for those that have had business interruption and those individuals uh, that have lost uh, their homes. I just visited a number of structures uh, that were destroyed, a familiar sight to all of us, devastating sight to those impacted lives, literally torn asunder. And we wanted to make sure that they have quick access to cash and reimbursements. I want to compliment and thank the President of the United States, Donald Trump, for his quick actions through FEMA uh, on securing our what we call FMAG, which allows initially 75 percent of our costs associated with these efforts to be reimbursed. Uh, we want to complement uh, their willingness to engage as quickly as they uh, did. As a consequence of that and the consequence of the two emergency declarations that I've announced here in Sonoma County and in Los Angeles County, uh, we are moving uh, as expeditiously as we can. Final point, and 
then we'll get you to the folks in uniform, the experts that you came here to get updated on those 16,000 acres and that 5% containment on the Kincaid fire in particular. But that is the issue of resources that the state anticipated in a circumstance like this. I want to compliment Senator McGuire, Assemblyman Wood, for their leadership, their stewardship, for their steadfastness, for their demands of me and their colleagues to prepare for this wildfire season because they've had enough as representatives of this community. We put $75 million up in the budget to anticipate these blackouts. Uh, today, we're announcing that we are distributing those funds. Uh, $26 million is now being made available immediately for counties, counties uh, like those, the two representative supervisors um, uh, are uh, responsible for. Uh, those dollars will be based grants, depending on population. Those that have been impacted by blackouts will have additional resources, and then we'll have the ability to provide proportional resources based upon need, up to $26 million immediately. We are providing uh, money as well uh, to the big 13 cities, $500,000 base grants, uh, and additional resources above that based on the discretion uh, of our Office of Emergency Service. Also, tribal lands. We were just up at River Rock, which, by the way, did a heroic job uh, keeping their structures safe, and by the way, keeping other structures safe. They have a million gallon well up there, or at least, uh, I guess, cistern of sorts, or storage capacity, which we were able to utilize and draw down. There were resources there uh, overnight uh, getting the benefit of their work. Uh, we're providing money for our tribal lands as well. Uh, and then reimbursements, tens of millions of dollars for state agencies so they can move quickly to address the needs uh, in a discretionary manner uh, for communities impacted by these blackouts, impacted uh, by this disruption. So that's a broad strokes overview. Uh, I want to again just thank the extraordinary heroism uh, of the men and women that are out there on the front lines. I want to thank all the complementary agencies for their hard work. I want to thank the elected officials for their steadfastness and their stewardship. And I want to once again say this. We should not have to be here. There's years and years of greed, years and years of mismanagement, particularly with the largest investor-owned utility in the state of California, PG&E. That greed has precipitated in a lack of intentionality and focus on hardening their grid, undergrounding their transmission lines. They simply did not do their job. It took us decades to get here, but we will get out of this mess. We will hold them to an account that they have never been held in the past. We will do everything in our power to restructure PG&E so it is a completely different entity when they get out of bankruptcy by June 30th of next year. We will hold them accountable for the business interruption and costs associated with these blackouts, and we will do the same with the other two investor-owned utilities in Southern California. We have a new president of the PUC. She was up in Reading having public hearings, and she will take them to task. Mark my word, it is a new day of accountability, a new day of transparency, but I cannot look any of you in the eye and honestly say that we can snap our fingers and address a decade of mismanagement. And while I have been here nine months, unfortunately I have not been here nine years. And I will do my best to make sure that we are never again in this position. But I do want folks to know the kind of investments that are necessary will take a little bit of time. But with all due respect, not 10 years. This is not the new normal. This cannot continue. The system simply cannot absorb it. But nonetheless, we have to recognize we are living in a new world, particularly in a state like ours. After a five-year historic drought, after 15 of the 20th most destructive fire seasons just since 2000, because of climate change, yes, because the hots are getting hotter and the dries are getting drier and the wets are getting wetter, which has hit and abetted these grass fires because of those rains that went later into the season now that are drying up. We have a unique responsibility and obligation to do more and better than any other jurisdiction anywhere in the United States of America. We'll meet that moment, but please understand that moment cannot happen overnight, but I recognize it can't 
happen too soon. And we are resolved and we are collectively rolling, rolling, rowing in the same direction. Uh, so that's my long-winded preamble. I know you all got that edited uh, already. Uh, but now let me ask uh, the head of the Office of Emergency Service to update you on some more technical issues that I imagine you're interested in, and also then ask the chief of CAL FIRE uh, to come up as well to talk a little bit more about how we're pre-positioned and how we are preparing for this weekend. Mark and Chief. Governor, as he comes up, one thing real yeah. quickly uh, that we were going to do is uh, queremos también agradecer todos que están representando la comunidad latina. Uh, hay algunos de nosotros que, pode, que, que se puede estar disponible para entrevistas y otras cosas después. Uh, tenemos muchos recursos y aquí bien cerquita también hay un uh, centro comunitario en la ciudad de Hillsburg donde hay mucha gente que habla en español como primer lengua y eso es uno de, 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 los, de las cosas de los de las, las cosas de, que está mejor esta vez que hace dos años es hay mucho más integration entre las comunidades. So I just wanted to say that to anybody. We, we're, we're working better and faster with multilingual community, and that's one of the things we wanted to, to relay to everybody. Thank Chief you. Porter. Thank you, Governor. Um, so on the fire, I'm not going to give a full briefing on the fire. We can cover that uh, on separate uh, pieces and parts and questions uh, as, we, as we move on. Uh, what we, we do know is that we're about 21,900 21, acres that as of this morning, 5% contained. Uh, we're working diligently on closing the doors that are still open on this fire. Uh, there's still a lot of open line. Uh, we have bulldozers, hand crews all working to, to put line in to bring those containment numbers up. But with wind coming back to us, we're very concerned that we we uh, not only get line in, but also have line that we can hold. So it's, it's a fluid process right now. The fire is not moving a lot today, but it is uh, just because we're in this kind of transition period and we're worried about the winds resurfacing. What I wanted to also uh, spend a little time, the governor just mentioned, we, we have put the 747 uh, Global Super Tanker on contract. Uh, for California exclusive use. Uh, there are now three uh, very large air tankers, two DC-10s and the 747 all available to California. We are looking at what the next week has in store for us. We're going to have weather that's going to continue to give us challenges. Uh, it's going to give us challenges no matter what the spark is. So we have also uh, our assets that we're working through the California National Guard. Uh, and the governor's uh, uh, direction to uh, have remote sensing capabilities to tell us when and where fires are starting 24-7. Also, making sure that we can get to fires early and get resources there, put them out before they get big. We have been putting out more than 95% of the fires that are happening in California for the last several days uh, at 10 acres or less. We have been very active. There are a few that have escaped. This is the kind of situation and season when those fires can happen. Uh, we're all aware of that. So we have upstaffed. We're working with local government. Uh, uh, Director Gilarducci will mention some of, the, some of the local government assets that we're bringing in, the pre-positioning. But all of this is a concert, ground resources, air resources, uh, remote sensing, cameras that we, we're adding to the camera fidelity across the, the, uh, the state uh, through the governor's budget. All of these things are helping us to get better fidelity and get resources to where they need to be to protect lives and property. It's important for everybody to understand this is the time of year when the fire starts that we can't put out in that early stage it's going to start running in a direction and we're going to have to evacuate. You have to work with your local, uh, listen to your, your local uh, uh, law enforcement and fire officials and when they say it's time to go, it's time to go. We have ready, set, go. You better be set right now. Have your go bag ready. When you're told to go, go. This is life and safety that we're talking about and it needs to happen then. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn over the mic to 
Director Gellarducci. Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon. Um, so a couple things I want to mention. Uh, we have really, as a result of the fire weather conditions that are now really in, in uh, uh, statewide, we're seeing hot, dry, windy conditions, uh, red flag conditions throughout the state. Uh, we've had to really lean in and respond in a probably the, the, the largest uh, way we have ever done. The governor mentioned a number of, of ways we're looking at situational awareness to drive all of that intelligence into the state operations center so that we can try to stay out in front of these evolving crisis situations. Now we understand that the PSPS is, a, is an element uh, that is com com uh, making it more complex. Um, and we, we know that we're coming off of a PSPS here shortly, but we're gonna go into another PSPS event coming up here Saturday evening into Sunday, and that may last a little bit longer. And so in, uh, uh, those are elements of um, a symptom of a larger problem that we're dealing with, and that is the fire weather and the red flag conditions. These are dangerous conditions, and we want everybody, as the chief said, uh, to take very, very close attention to that the State Operations Center in Sacramento and all of our regional operations centers um, are all fully active or remain fully activated 24-7 through the remainder of next week. Um, we are in close coordination with all of our fire mutual aid assets. Um, I want to uh, uh, highlight uh, Chief Gosner from Santa Rosa Fire, who's here, and, and our police chief from Santa Rosa, uh, Ray Navarro, who's here, uh, as well as our board supervisor chair, uh, David Rabbit. We're working with all of these entities um, local and state and even our federal partners to ensure that we have all the resources in place uh, for these events. As Chief Porter mentioned, the goal is to try to keep these fires as small as possible. Part of that, the governor mentioned, was a uh, allotment of funds in a new program uh, to pre-position fire assets that are from uh, local government and from state uh, OES, and we have those, we have pre-positioned those assets, these they're, they're specialized strike teams or task forces here within Sonoma County, um, as well as in Marin County and in Napa County um, uh, and in um, uh, Alameda County, so that, so that these strike teams of engines can be immediately deployed to new starts. They're an augmentation of the existing forces that are on the ground, and I really want to give a shout out to our state fire and rescue mutual aid system, our, our local fire agencies that participate in that state program and are augmenting. We're approaching this like a battle and we have to really think about it as strategically as possible in our ability to get uh, resources. That's good intelligence, situational awareness, good communications and having the right resources on the ground. And as Chief Porter mentioned, a lot of that is the responsibility of each and every one of the citizens be prepared, be aware, have your equipment, your supplies ready to go, and if told to evacuate, do so. During a PSPS event, there are gonna be conditions where gas stations may not have power. You should be thinking about that now, having your cars fueled up and ready to go. You should have a family plan, a communications plan, power for your devices, very important. Understand that there is extensive law enforcement uh, uh, capabilities within the county as well as through our mutual aid system. We have also tasked the California Highway Patrol to up staff personnel for security throughout the power outage area. And, and we, we don't want you to make runs or get into conflicts uh, at gas stations or at food stores. Think through that now and, and plan accordingly to be prepared for when these events happen. Um, so, uh, this is really sort of an unprecedented uh, place that we are in as a state, uh, but as the governor said, we um, will get past it and we will get through it together uh, in an effort to be able to um, um, be, be better uh, as we move out through the other side of this. Okay, who am I going to now? Okay. Well, we'll just, yeah, why don't we bail ourselves to any questions and you can have at any of us Yeah, yeah, we, we saw, I mean, just at smaller versions of what has become all too familiar up here from 17 and 18. Um, and that's homes completely destroyed, cars um, that look like they've been in a war zone. 
uh, and uh, everything all but melted down except a few curious items. Um, right next door, a home that's completely untouched. And this, the remarkable, um, you know, just serendipity that is a fire. Uh, then again, there are some that make perfect sense because defensible spaces were provided, it was more green, uh, people had uh, focused um, on perhaps upgrading uh, some of their uh, well, materials on their roof and their decks and the like. But uh, we, we at this moment, and this is a number that will change, um, we have 21 uh, structures, individual residential structures rather, uh, that have been impacted and 40, 28 uh, outbuildings. So yeah, so 28 outbuildings, 21 residential structures that we know of at this moment that have been destroyed. Um, you see vineyards that have been impacted, obviously tremendous amount of land will assess the wildlife damage. Uh, but um, it's a big, big area and uh, there are a lot of hot spots still and uh, there's still a lot of suppression work that's needed, but we are benefiting because of this respite of the winds and so people are out there uh, as aggressively as they can be for this moment. Well, we'll see. That's what they say. I'm not convinced that that's what they'll end up doing. We have a lot of tools in our toolkit, the Public Utilities Commission, a bankruptcy judge, a federal judge by the name of Judge Alsup, public opinion, morality, ethics, good business practice, judgment, all those things are on our side. Well, that's the, the, through the bankruptcy process, in order to come out of bankruptcy, they're trying to recapitalize. They have people from Wall Street that are trying to make a bid. Elliott Management's one of them, well known. They're doing their own uh, internal uh, bid. There's people that are looking at their assets, potentially break them up, gas division versus electric division. Cities like San Francisco are making bids. El San Jose, the mayor said he was interested in making bids. So all these things are happening. And that's all part of this bankruptcy process. That's all part of them emerging out of bankruptcy. And my hope is, not just my hope, but our efforts have, have been focused for many, many months as we've reached out to potential bidders to see more people enter this space and provide creative strategies to modernize uh, this entity and determine whether or not it's simply too big. But there's no specific plan yet. Oh, there are details that have been laid out. Specific plans have been presented to the bankruptcy judge. Take a look. Uh, the state is not making a bid to purchase pg e If that's the question, uh, that is not currently on our agenda. That being said, I said currently on the agenda. Well, I'd lie if I said there wasn't a discussion. There was a discussion, but I would also be errant if I said that discussion was conclusive, meaning that determination and investigation was complete. It is neither determined uh, nor is that investigation complete. This moment in our history where millions of people are impacted throughout the state. But again, again I, I just want to paint a picture because this is the northern part of the state. Um, in Southern California, not dissimilar experience, just not at the scale and scope. Uh, Edison is turning off the power. San Diego is turning off the power. Um, San Diego's been doing it since 2007. Interestingly, the new San Diego fire has now occurred in and around where that 2007 fire occurred, where a lot of lessons were learned. I, I, I grant San Diego Gas and Electric this no other utility, arguably in the country, is more successful in their strategies for de-energization. But it is a tool in their toolkit. But they are able to do it with precision, a scalpel, versus the scope and scale of PG&E because they've made investments, because they've been more intentional on focusing on you and public safety over them, bonuses, and shareholders. And that's the fundamental contrast between the way they operate and the way Pacific Gas and Electric has operated over the last few decades. Governor, Sonoma County in particular has been designated a high-risk capacity increase. Residents are scared, residents are angry, residents want answers. What reassurances can you give to Sonoma County about what they've done 
Well, that's why we're up here, and I'd encourage you to rewind everything that was just said in terms of our proactive efforts to pre-position assets, the extraordinary work that everybody you see around me is doing to make sure people uh, are protected and people are made safe. Uh, the work that's been doing, people are knocking on every door, looking at every structure. They're tagging those structures to see if they're safe. Uh, they're out there uh, doing everything they possibly can. You're going to see more assets as the air clears up and the wind now is dying down, more assets in the air. You've got bulldozers out there. You've got line crews out there. They are already proactively anticipating uh, where the weather is going, the wind conditions, what they'll look like. Uh, it is remarkable our ability to protect, predict the precision, with precision, uh, the acuity of those winds, the gusts, and then map out and anticipate how best to utilize our resources today so that we can protect people tomorrow. That would be called, Phil, a bailout. It doesn't surprise me that PG&E is looking for a bailout. We will not bail out PG&E. Well, I, it's, I, they should be outraged. They should be infuriated. And they should direct their ire at the mismanagement of Pacific Gas and Electric, who for decades have created conditions that led to this moment. That said, what we're anticipating right now, we're down to about, what, 6,700 customers that are currently de-energized. And we should expect most of those customers to get back on today, probably at the latest few, I imagine, scattered tomorrow. Uh, but we expect more power outages Saturday evening at the moment into Sunday, hopefully turning back on on Monday. Uh, and we are doing everything in our power to mitigate the scale and scope of that and to make sure that they turn back the power on as quickly as they can. Let me on that subject make a point that's important to make. When the determination to turn back on power is made, you can't do it unless you investigate the lines to make sure that they're safe. And that takes time. What we have done, so you know where the state has been, we are providing air resources, infrared technology, so even during nighttime, the California Highway Patrol and its planes can do a lot of that investigation to supplement the work that's being done by PG&E, all in an effort to as quickly as humanly possible get those lights back on. They have specific prescriptive ultimatum. I would encourage you to go back to the legislation we passed in July, which was historic and an heroic effort to get ahead of ourselves before the fire season. In that legislation are specific, measurable roles and responsibilities that we all will play, the state, Public Utilities Commission, the IOUs, the city and counties with support from the state, but more importantly, the uh, the utilities themselves that have a $5 billion obligation to invest in public safety, hardening, undergrounding, vegetative management, et cetera, including technology that allows them more precision to de-energize without having to turn off a switch where the entire house goes out, but one room at a time. All of that is laid out in that legislation, legally required if they're ever to access the capital that we're willing to put up to help PG&E get out of bankruptcy and secure the other IOUs so that they can go out the bond markets with higher ratings and be able to access capital to complete their improvements. I don't mean to complicate this, but we spent six months on a daily basis working to put together that package, and I cannot impress upon you more to look at what now is required. We're not reacting to this moment. We specifically laid out a framework and a direct pathway for them to get back to solvency and get back into the business of being a good business. Anybody else? Could you or the team talk a little bit more about the complications you're facing fighting the fire when you don't have power? How that is I'll leave that to the expert. <laughs> thank you, Governor. And thank you for the question. So um, fighting the fire with power shutoff, it doesn't change a lot of the fire fight itself. Uh, communication flow and particularly communication flow with the public uh, is where the, the bulk of the challenge is. Um, Sonoma has worked diligently to uh, better inform the public through early morning systems. And so some of that is happening here. 
Uh, some of that still needs to be built out, built out and, and brought to bear um, in other parts of the state. But in general, uh, the actual act of firefighting is not a difficult process with the power out. We usually are fire, fighting fire with the power out because fires take out the power as well. There is something that's important to know, though. We have critical infrastructure for firefighting that when there's no power, makes it difficult to do. For instance, retardant plants at air bases, they require power to churn and mix the retardant, pump it into the airplanes that drop the retardant. The important thing here is that we know this, we put generators in place, we're ready to go. So we flip the generator on, we mix the retardant, we pump the retardant, doesn't matter if the base is out of, out of power. So these are things that the state has leaned forward We've been working with the utilities, understanding that this was going to happen uh, potentially over the last uh, eight or ten months, and knowing that there are places where we're going to have to do those kind of things. We have, and that is how we're getting around some of the power-related issues. Uh, and that is a typical issue when, when we're talking about wildland fire. Wildland fire is different than municipal fire, and we have had fires running into municipal areas. It's part of the reason we need to get people out of the way, because we're not just fighting a fire in a structure that might spread to another structure. We're talking about a conflagration that's coming into a town. People need to be out of the way. We can't ensure that we're going to be able to save every one of those structures. We're going to try, but we can't ensure. In Number one is people, lives, and property, second. Then, so the water source is something that, that we often deal with, and it's not something new to us. There are cer certain systems that require power to remain the charged and keep the, uh, the uh, tanks full that, that, uh, that then enter the system, and we are adept at working through that doesn't change the fact that there could be a group of firefighters that are trying to find water during an event and they may not be able to do that or may not be able to find sufficient water. But that is something that we deal with regularly and we adapt and overcome. Last question. Yeah, can, I, can I take advantage sure. of this question being posed to the sheriff proactively? Because, Sheriff, we want to anticipate Saturday night, yes. Sunday, uh, and what we should expect from a public safety perspective and how you guys are doing heroic work. Thank you. Um, my name is Mark Essek. I'm the sheriff of Sonoma County. So some of the things that we've taken proactive steps on um, to deal with power outages is kind of going back to the older style. We've equipped all of our patrol cars with the high-low siren. So we are able to get out into neighborhoods, knock on doors, and do evacuations without having to have technology, without having to have power. So that's the most basic step we've taken. We've really leaned into that. Currently, we have over 50 deputies in the Geyserville area, in the, east, the hills east of Geyserville. They are there right now to help people evacuate. They're there to answer questions, be there for them, provide direction, and when the time comes, to use those high-low sirens to evacuate people.